Chauncey is a product manager in identity and access management space at Microsoft. She has a decade of experience with demonstrated history of shipping enterprise as well as consumer products across endpoints like cloud, mobile, and PC. She's spoken at several conferences including TED and storytelling is her swag. Claim to fame, she holds a world record in her name for making the world's largest fully solvable maze. We've got Ken, who's also been at Microsoft his entire career, working as a senior product manager and a recovering engineer across Windows, MSN, Bing, and identity divisions. Outside of work, Ken can be frequently found tweeting security memes on Twitter. Fun fact, Swift on security, with 350K followers and follows, also follows Ken on Twitter. <laughs> I mean, Twitter. <laughs> Claim to fame, Ken attended DEF CON 4. That's, 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 th that's there. There were 150 people. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, abstract from the talk, even though we all use identity and access systems everywhere in our lives every day, access control, ensuring users are, are able to do just the right amount of things in as seamless and unobtrusive manner as possible, is still the most commonly misconfigured security weakness. Currently ranking at number one on the open on the OWASP top 10 for 2021. In this talk, we'll discuss common access control problems, how to detect them in your apps and services, and how developers could avoid introducing them in the future by following best practices and recommendations. The talk builds on years of experience securing thousands of applications. It's going to be a useful talk for IT managers, developers, both looking to secure their ecosystems. Give it up. Thank y'all. Yeah, I think on the mic. I, all right, hey. So first of all, this community wouldn't exist uh, if it wasn't for volunteers and for the organizers. So I want to just give a round of applause to all of the, the people that worked on the committees um, and the people helping out. So thanks, everyone, for that. Um, um, it's been a very long time since I was in Dallas. Um, my grandparents lived here. Um, and. I haven't seen that much of it, but um, it's really nice to be back. Um, just to start, the uh, broken access control. Um, broken access control is something that is incredibly important. Like it's something that shows up on the the top of the OWASP top ten. It seems obvious, um, but we're going to talk a little bit more about um, like what it is and how we can like try to actually solve this this problem. The um, first thing I'd like to say is that even though we work together, um, we're not here representing work. We're not trying to sell you on anything, and we're going to uh, to, to try not to say the word cyber. Um, the The goal for this is to talk about how can we address the problem with the industry. Uh, the fact that this is the top uh, OWASP issue shows that even though it's obvious and everyone knows about it, whatever we're doing is not working. So there's more that we can do. So that's that's the goal. Um, who are we? Well, we just had a wonderful introduction, so we can gloss over this a little bit. Um, so my name's Ken. Um, I have a background primarily in engineering, and that's uh, kind of how I come into this. Um, reliability and thinking about how do we do the design and architecture um, to have more, um, more ability to, to control the, the outcomes and, and what can we do in our engineering processes to include the security. Would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Hey everybody, thanks for being here. Uh, this is Jansi. I am, uh, I, w I work for Microsoft and about five years old in the company. I'm about an one year old in identity though. Uh, thank you so much for having us here. I think the charter that I deal with Microsoft is roughly around uh, crafting developer experiences when they're integrating with Microsoft identity platform, which includes a set of authentication and authorization libraries and their platform experiences and how do we securely request access for data and resource, so on and so forth, and all that stuff that counts under the privacy charter. That's roughly what I deal with. Uh, this is my first talk uh, at any uh, B-sides. Does it go in the protocol to understand what is the audience uh, community like? Are we having more developers here? Do we have architects? Do we have security personnel? What is the mix of audience like? Maybe I can some ask some questions. Uh, how many of you guys are developers here? Okay. Uh, 
architects, application security architects. OK. And anybody in the engineering side, engineering managers? OK. OK, awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, gives me a good perspective of what we should uh, really concentrate on, because there can be many flavors to any talk, as you understand, right? Uh, sure, go ahead. Yeah. All right. First, I'm going to start with a story. Um, this isn't real, but um, I think you'll identify with it. Um, buzz, buzz, late night phone call. The, the, the phone on the dresser starts lighting up the room. You, like, you sit up, being on call is no fun. You go and take a look. Uh, hello? Yeah, security researchers found uh, an exposed endpoint, and we need someone to, to look into it. Like you start walking over to your machine, start booting it up. While you're doing that, you're looking through your email on your phone, trying to figure out, like, you know, what are we trying to do here? Oh crap! I thought those servers were decommissioned last year. All right, the on-call engineer has already shut off access to the machines, and now it's up to us to start digging through the logs. That's not how you want to find out about access management. I can do that. So here is roughly how uh, the outline of our ta talk today is going to be, right? We'll start with what exactly are access control policies? Uh, what is the issue with them being broken? What are the common broken access control issues that we see in industry at large today? Uh, how to sort of detect them? Because if it's clearly listed as a top vulnerability by OWASP, and for any of you who is not familiar with OWASP, it's, uh, it's, it's, a sta it's an open source nonprofit standard that is committed towards improving application security. So what they do is they release these lists of top API vulnerabilities or security issues. You can find out more if you go to the OWASP.org. But for the year 2021, broken access control is listed as a top security vulnerability. So we're trying to draw your attention towards this particular issue as to what exactly are access control issues. Uh, why are they broken? In what forms are they broken? So we'll go ahead and see some of the common broken access control issues. How do we detect them? Because I think that's the first step to even address and solve them. And then we'll go ahead and cover some of the remediation steps. And then we'll also sort of observe uh, what exactly manifests out of these broken access control issues. These are some of the small issues in your APIs, you know, relating to permissions, access management, elevated privilege, so on and so forth. But they actually manifest into bigger damages in industry. We'll cover some of the massive data breaches that has happened. Uh, we'll draw your attention towards that. Just to emphasize that if they're not fixed at the code level, this is what they would manifest into a few years down the lane. And then we'll also talk about the best practices, about how can you detect them, fix them, and sort of get a closure over in your code uh, in the production environment itself. That's how the rough outline of this talk is going to be. Now. Uh, Let's start with what exactly is access control, right? I'll start with the textbook definition. It says, it goes like this. Access control is identifying a person doing a specific job, authenticating them by looking at their identity, and then giving that person only the key to the door. The key here is only, only the key to the door or computer or the resource that they need an access to, and nothing more. As simple as that, right? Just identifying who the person is and, and trying to understand what he's trying to access and just giving him that access, as simple as that. Well, sounds e very easy a as per the definition, but then why is it listed as the top vulnerability today? That's what we're trying to understand. Now, I think Ken will talk about what are the common broken access control issues that we see today. Um, yeah, the like, I promise we won't do any more uh, you know, definitions from like standard textbooks. That was just the um, CISSP uh, definition. All right, why is it so common? Um, most broken access control are logic errors, not, they're not code errors. Like you don't find them by compiling and seeing it not work or, or things like that. It's hard to scan, it's hard to, it's not like buffer uh, overflows and things that can be detected like readily. Um, quite often, especially in larger organizations, you have gaps between ownership where um, servers become lost. They just sort of drift out there in, in the wild. Um, or you have uh, gaps in teams where they don't quite uh, connect. 
So the, the handoff from one team to another doesn't uh, do the right verification, things like that. Um, it's really important to point out that this also doesn't apply to only code and software. This is uh, physical security. It deals with how your customer support like gives access to customers to their, their accounts and things, and it includes your system governance. If you've got tenant admins or people that are in charge of resetting the uh, developer permissions or assigning uh, like the, the permissions and things, all of those need to be thought about from the perspective of what if someone got fished, will they be able to just turn that into instant root access? Well, compliance enforcement um, unfortunately doesn't work that well. Um, because typically, compliance is based on checklists. As long as you do one, two, three, then you're a compliant, and then you can go off to the races. Um, ensure that you patch, don't roll your own crypto, avoid non-memory safe languages. Like These are all good things to do, good and, and absolutely should be done. Um, but when we're talking about um, broken access control, there tends to be more about what's the scenario, and, and it requires more um, upfront time. So it's something where sometimes pulling in the right people to ask the right questions is really important. The developers are often uh, assigned work without having as much of a connection with how it's being used by the customer. And that also can lead to disconnects um, very subtle in how people understand the problem versus what they're actually implementing to fix the problem. We see it all the time in, in regular functional bugs. It also applies to this. And there's quite often a lack of documentation on what those assumptions are, even when um, people are, are agreeing ab uh, with what they're doing. It doesn't get documented, so it gets lost. And then later on, when people have to go in and do a bug fix or do something else, then they don't know about those assumptions. Um, an example of an assumption would be that only dogs can use doggy doors. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so this is the the only really great comedy slide, so please appreciate it. The, <laughs> um, the, the main thing is that like everything that we make assumptions on is this disprovable. It's just this is the really obvious one. All right, there are 34 uh, weaknesses that are identified for broken access control. It's a really long list, and a lot of them group into specific areas. So just to sum it up like kind of briefly, directory traversals, uh, when people are given access to a specific location and then they're able to somehow worm their way out of it and go to other places. Um, elevated privileges, um, it's kind of self-explanatory whenever you're able to do something you shouldn't be allowed to. Um, improper and missing authentication where we don't actually know who it is, we're just giving them the stuff. Um, I want to call out Confused Deputy. Um, in particular, it's, it's a little bit vague in what the name is, but it's almost the definition of social engineering. Confused Deputy is when you are able to convince some other actor to do things on, on using its credentials that you want it to do. So a Confused Deputy would be like, if you can ping a web server and get it to forward your ping with its own credentials, or if, uh, um, like in the case of social engineering, you ask someone to just send you money. Um, you can't directly ping their bank and like get money, but the bank will trust them, so it works. All right. Okay. Um, so, do any of you have experienced any of these issues in your <laughs> 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 you application this, development life cycle, or heard about it, or read about it? Any interesting experiences to share? <laughs> Otherwise, I can share mine. <laughs> so I've heard about the story recently, right? So uh, back when Apple was still not so solid on their privacy and security uh, constructs, I guess uh, a particular uh, a particular student rookie called up Apple customer care and uh, tried to update an existing Apple employee's profile with a new credit card information. So he would give out his credit card information and get the details updated. Well, good so far, right? He would call up after a few days and verify himself giving the credit card information, establish his identity, 
and then he has now access to everything literally regarding that account's profile right from his other profile information to the data to the machines that he's logged into and he had a complete control and authority over it still it was till the time it was detected and fixed so i mean even things like that are broken access control it's not necessarily what i put inside my code uh, like ken was trying to draw your attention to some time back we are not just talking about software code practices which involves authentication and authorization experiences we are also talking about the information access that is sometimes given over something like a customer support channel or even the physical access uh, let's say in a hospital in an unauthorized room or something how do you sort of break out and break, break out into that and get an unauthorized access to information so the umbrella of broken access control is really vast and uh, what we are trying to cover is some of the best practices so that you can avoid running into such issues now why do we want to avoid running into such issues here's the answer uh, some of the major and visible Uh, damages that have happened because of having some sort of broken access control in your system are like these are the top four uh, incidents right so experian has uh, sort of leaked 24 million customer data and that that has been in the news for a long time and i had i think they had a lot of damage control to do so that they secure the customer information so is the case with adobe i think about 7.7 to 8 million data has been exposed in the creative uh, adobe create, Cl create cloud and also the recent social engineering attack with uber right i think it was also about phishing the mfa uh, uh, process of authentication so somebody was uh, given the multi factor authentication multiple times and then he was approached on whatsapp he gave his details and then you know attackers got an access into the uh, entire system and therefore they could uh, sort of get a hang over the source code as well so and and also another another of the major examples is uh, about 1 million clubhouse data has also been exposed so data breaches phishing attacks uh, compromised identities identity theft stolen access so on and so forth broken access control manifests itself into many la and large damage damages in the industry in the past so which is why we want developers to be really really aware of this as they start coding and they start putting practice policies and practices into their production environment now what can we do about it i think ken will cover about hey how do we identify them and uh, how do we sort of address them yeah so i've got this broken into four parts um so auditing because all the things you don't know about like auditing is not sexy and every talk practically seems to say we should do more auditing nobody ever does like it's so it's the it's definitely a, a challenge but like it's not enough to just know the machines are there you also need to know who owns them who's responsible for them and who do we contact if there's an emergency um so that information is critical and the the more you can do the better you need to also keep track of where backups are file shares it's not just uh, specific machines apis um modeling is a really powerful way to try to identify problems especially around logic so since we're talking about broken access control and it frequently being a logical issue um so threat modeling of course is is great then it's a standard but state machines actually can work very well if you're able to keep track of what's the state of the user like what's the the type of call and how is it supposed to move through the system it's a better way to recognize when when you move into like a a questionable state or you don't or or you don't have the right controls in place um finally failure mode analysis because when the system's working in its normal mode you might be hardened but if it goes into a failover state or something you might have ex a lot of exposure so it's important to just be paying attention to what are our types of uh, of remediations the types of things we're likely to do and if you think about it in the daytime before you know the middle of the night you can make better decisions um uh, under processes the um, processes are like the like the things we put in place for controlling how we're doing things um so i'm just calling out again governance the governance just being what permissions do you give to apps like make sure that they have the least privileged permissions that you're not giving broad ones just because it's easier and faster but like but they you're able to dial it in so that if there is a a compromise then it it minimizes the the risk um it includes 
like if you're using production systems and for, for big big systems, you should make sure that no one person can make any change. Every change should be reviewed and go through like a multiple stages. Like just things like that. Like it's thinking about password resets, thinking about the common things that people do. We've already seen examples recently of attackers going through and compromising systems through the CI CD pipeline. So, so thinking through how those things are set up is really important. And customer support is also, like customer support people think of themselves as help or, like helpers, they don't think of themselves as security guards. So making sure that they're aware of, like in the Apple case that was mentioned, the, the, the customer support person was being really nice. You know, John Doe calls up and says, here's my credit card number, I need to add it to my account. They say, oh yeah, of course, only John Doe would do that. We don't need to verify who you are. They add the credit card number, and then later, the, you know, five minutes later, the person calls back, gets a different agent, says, hi, I'm John Doe, and to prove it, here's my credit card number. And then they just trusted him because it, they didn't have controls around how the data, like if they're gonna use a credit card number as a password, they need to treat it like a password. Um, finally, specialists um, are always helpful, and there's a few number of specialists, and there's a lot of engineers and a lot of, of challenges, so it's important to try to get the right people at the right time, and the, and the further down this list you go, the more expensive it is. The sooner you find the bug, the less expensive it is to fix. So security reviews within your team, with the security PMs, with people that are available, is the best, but um, pen tests are still important for like bigger releases and of course bug bounties um, so that at least when the good guys find it then they can tell you. This is kind of the thesis that, that I want to call out. The most important thing is communicating with your developers. Like everyone in this room is probably has like a really strong security mindset and if they were looking at the software they would find the problem and go ah this is definitely an issue and needs to be fixed. The problem is that for every one of you, there's a hundred other people that are maybe customer specialists, people that are very good at distributed computing or machine learning, but they're not necessarily thinking like an adversary and they're not necessarily going to, to recognize this problem. So you don't scale. The only way to, to get that work and to get the security in place is to build those relationships and be able to, I mean, like shift left and dev DevSecOps are, are pretty popular now, but, the, but those concepts are that we need to have those relationships and we need to build trust with the engineering community. We need to understand what their challenges are because it's different on, this, the, on the InfoSec side than it is when you're under a lot of pressure to get that thing done by the end of Q3. Um, the best practices that I recommend, the, the more you can do as a leader, is to foster a culture of curiosity. Um, it's really easy to get into a rut, to just see your backlog and see all the things that need to happen. Um, the more you can do to reward curious behavior and get people actually thinking about um, the world in a different way, um, like kind of open your eyes, think about it again, Bring in the big picture. Think about the architecture. What's my role in this, and how do I like, how do I make the whole system secure? That's a huge change in perspective. Um, and as a leader, if you're able to like send out positive emails to the managers of the people that do a good job of it, things like that, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. It helps them at review time, and it does a huge amount to show leadership and to help like drive the behavior you want to see. It doesn't always have to be a stick. Carrots work really well. Um, negative testing, especially in a move fast, break things type of uh, world, people go, does the, does the unit test pass? It does, great, ship it. They're not necessarily testing, you know, as soon as it works the way it's supposed to, great. But you also need to make sure it doesn't work when it's not supposed to. There's a lot of ways that we would just miss and people just aren't paying attention to because of, trying to get their backlog and get get to the next thing. Um, all APIs are public. If you have an internal API, it might currently be internal, but you shouldn't expect it will always be internal. It's just a good practice to always, you know, do defense in depth, like 
this is the only time I'm going to say zero trust. Um, make sure that the that all of the places that you can put in hardness um, and and make things um, more protected, the better. And so this is something that just shouldn't be skipped over. Look. Uh, avoiding obfuscation, so eschewing it means uh, like not doing it, um, but it's the most complicated way you can say it. Um, so we can't depend on security through obscurity. The scanners are getting better and better, and the worms are getting more and more sophisticated. And you know, if we just leave things out there thinking they're not going to be found, then it's just a, a time bomb. And please don't use basic auth. Um, the more you can use OAuth and like and and strong cert um, cert protection, the better. Um, there's amazing technology now, and there's no excuse for storing anyone's password. All right, returning to the fictional story, this is a different experience. Uh, the same person as before, but now they're waiting in line for coffee in the morning. Um, while they're skimming through their work emails, they see that. Uh, so I, the decommissioning of the legacy service has been delayed again. Well, that happens. Um, getting customers to move off of these are hard. It's really hard. Like Naming things is the hardest. But after naming things, getting people to move off of old APIs and things is almost impossible. It always takes work. Um, Fortunately, the owning team has already put together a data sheet. We know what data is on these things. We and now they're going to uh, have to provide a quarterly update to the leadership to explain what they're going to do about it and how they're going to um, work with the customers to, to get off of it. Um, looking up, the person sees the barista is ready to take their order, and so they ask for a skinny grande vanilla latte. So whenever access control works, it's effortless, right? It's like networking. A, a network admin on a good day looks like they're not working. And on a bad day, like everything's on fire and it's horrible. So when we do it right, everything is better. So we just have to get to that point. Blue sky. Uh, all right, that's, that's it for our presentation. Do anyone have any questions? Inspi is this inspiring? Does it help you? I hope it gives you a different perspective. Uh, we could have gone through and just read a bunch of dictionary definitions, but um, there's a lot of information on the internet. Um, the OWASP uh, top 10 is a great place to start. You can find a lot of information from the, the CISSP training. Um, but I know the thing about the community and the thing about um, coming to B-Sides is the conversations in the hallway, the hopefully a spark of inspiration that gives you something different that you weren't going to find. Um, and now, you know, there's also some more uh, buzzwords you can uh, do searches on. So hopefully that helps. Question. So what about um, that person you said earlier, whatever deputy? Oh, confused deputy. Confused deputy. Yes, yeah. yeah. Like oh, yeah, yeah. Please, can you press repeat the yes, yes. call? Yeah, please. sure. Okay, perfect. Um, usually I'm the person in the chair saying that. Thank you. Um, the question was, what was the deputy um, weakness? And the answer is confused deputy. Um, sometimes you'll see a picture of Barney Fife um, from, you know, the deputy from the 1960s Andy Griffith show. Um, yeah, basic. Anytime you can get someone else to make an action using their credentials instead of your own, instead of an on behalf of relationship, um, there's an opportunity to explain it. Yes, sir. Um, so, so the question is, um, how do you see? How do I see the maturity of the tools available? Um, so I'm biased because of where I work. Um, the a lot of the the frameworks and things that we offer are around trying to help um, like the tenant admins and the people that are responsible for overseeing their systems, um, all the users, like what permissions are given, role-based access, ways that you can try to, to limit things. 
I wouldn't say that it's that mature. I would say that it's it's still an area that has a lot of improvement. Um, UX can be better. Um, the way that we work with customers, um, it's very confusing. So, so the if you look at the industry leaders, so Microsoft, Okta, Ping, um, we all have visions that are like somewhat similar about how do we get people to not use passwords at all, like passwordless. Um, how do we, you know. The more prompts and things that we put in front of people, the more they um, w like hate it and want to like, go do something else. Um, we learned from Vista that that's not a not a great experience for people having a lot of security prompts. Um, so really, what we need to do is have the defaults be the best. Uh, instead of asking people, "Do you want to do the right thing?" We need to just make the right thing and then ask them if they want to do anything else other than the right thing, uh, and make it hard. Um, so so inertia is a good tool for, for driving good behavior. Um, as far as the tools go, I don't know. I, I think that we have some really interesting machine learning opportunities looking at uh, looking for anomalous behavior for the ability to um, you know to do more automation because cloud data is just so big. It's it's really difficult for any m like medium to large size company to stay on top of everything is is a challenge. And so the more that we can do and pull in end end to end um, encryption, endpoint um, uh, endpoint control, like the the bring your own devices things that are, are still something that you know opens us up to risk. So it, there's there's a lot of a lot of tools. Um, the scanners are getting better, so that's both a, a good thing and a bad thing. So does that help? Any more questions? Sir? With your logical backing, do you feel like that the fact that we have a remote access control that models with logical data, does that pop in with the certifications or going to Baldwin or just the implementation? So, yeah, so the, the question was when do the logic errors creep into the system? Is it during uh, design, uh, implementation, or uh, or like running in production? Um, all of the above. Um, the quite often the initial design is great, um, and then when we go to implement it, then we make trade-offs and we start to say, "Oh, well, it'll be more efficient if we do it this way," or um, we already have these systems, and so we need to plug into them, and so then there's an opportunity for change. Um, there's also a challenge where we tend to ship our org chart. So the, the code that's written tends to reflect the organization of the people working on the, the code as opposed to the, the, the smoothest design for, the, for big systems. Um, so when, when one, of the, one of the ways that you can help um, kind of avoid problems like this is if you have um, like an independent consultant like from the engineering team who is outside of the the iterations right if you're doing agile agile has a tendency to like make little tweaks as you're going and sometimes the it's not noticeable like as you make a slight adjustment to the right and a slight adjustment to the right and a slight adjustment to the right you know many cycles later you're now pointing this way instead of this way so sometimes having someone who's deliberately not involved like a senior engineering manager or someone, come back in and look periodically um, at the big checkpoints can help to recognize when you've started to drift away. Um, so APIs, the more you can use APIs, the better. So APIs is UX. Um, that gives you a clear understanding of what's the handshake between these things. Um, so that's a way for helping make sure that everyone's on the same page. If the more that we do, like passing files and things like that, the more um, the more likely we are to have um, you know strange things kind of crop up. I, hopefully that helps. All right. Okay. Well, um, thank you all for having us. Um, I hope that this was a helpful talk and that it's inspiring. I hope you have some really good conversations with engineering. You know, buy them donuts. Um, they'll they'll like it. Um, and thanks again for having us. Thank you so much. Guys.
can you take this machine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got room in my bag. Sorry, I hung the microphone there at the end. I should have. I should have let you take take some of the questions or something. No, that's fine. You have better at <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you. Oh yeah. Thank you. Sure. So next is um, it's pretty interesting. Are many of our development problems are not technical? Yeah. But rather social and cultural. That's that's why that's why I, that was why I moved, that's why I moved into piano. Like I used to, I was an engineer for a long time, and I realized that like the hard problems weren't the technical ones. Yeah, in my case, it's easy. I still get to interrogate <laughs> developers. So it's like yeah, when, well when you have you this as a multi-step process, you have some architect who, after marketing, makes contact, maybe gets into doing requirements, and then they get handed off to development, and developers are then like. What? And they don't get to talk to the customer at the beginning. You get to the derived requirements that you find out in the code repository. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -uh. I interrogate customers. My, my role in, in Microsoft, like one of, one of my primary ones is actually develop relations within Microsoft. So I work with teams from, from okay. like around identity. Uh -huh. so, so teams from Office to Xbox, mm -hmm. when they're um, when they need their identity permissions and solutions, then my team does the like we get, we tell them best practices. We like we help them get the permissions. What's the next one? Uh, the next one in here is the AWS S3 that was mm -hmm. set in the other room for 4:30. Oh, what time is that anyway? 2:10. Holy good grief. Good thing, it time flies. Yeah. This will be over before I know it. I better get my micro center order. Let me get out of your way. I'm always in the way as always. I'm good at that. Some people are are better in the way than others. Right. I 
get to do. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you are so big. You actually have a tremor in this stuff. Like, we have a lot. So, like, we have hundreds of thousands of players, but uh -huh. we have to worry about, like, I, I started in 1997 with Fun Factor working at Microsoft. Uh -huh. Windows 98 had just been out. Uh, we didn't even have a website. Or, like, we had to actually like, remote into uh -huh. file shares to install uh -huh. Office. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh, oh. So yeah, those, that was a long, long time ago. Yeah, no kidding. The interesting old days. Yeah, like and it's it's been a lot of fun to do some of these things. And of course, my daughter is a toddler. My daughter that was a toddler back then until she graduated from college two years ago. So uh, so things have gone by. Oh yeah. But uh, yeah, like even when I was working for Factor, I used to for stuff like scripting and stuff like that as a human or a kid. Because I always felt like the kids were really responsible and I felt like the kids were really annoying. But so it's interesting, your things have come full circle from the 80s. Because the 80s with lots of hardware platforms, little standardization of operating systems. We had the 90s where it was MS-DOS and a few others like the Amiga Cloud and what else was Apple. Yeah, like Apple. OS had a POS, so yeah. like BOSS. And that was in the 90s. Mm. We get the, two, the, the 2000s and it was, there was a little bit of Apple, Mac OS, Hyperlab. Mm. Everything else was Windows. There was a little bit of Linux, Linux. Solaris. Yeah. BSDs off yeah, to the side, yeah. but off to the side in the telco sector and mm -hmm. one or two others. That pretty much stayed this way until like the early teens. All of a sudden you had embe embedded ARM systems, GPUs, they ended up the Raspberry Pis and later successors. Yeah. With Linux on it and other OSs and all of a sudden it goes like this. And then now later add on other Windows and microcontroller devices. All of a sudden <laughs> under hood and everybody else in their system. So as far as I'm concerned, yeah, we have the big laptop mainstream, but the side that came back with a vengeance that was at last time at this size back in the early 80s. Yeah, well, the funny thing is the thing of the one of the proposed uh, post-quantum memory crypto uh, algorithms uh -huh. was backed by a team that, in like a matter of hours. Like old IBM PC or something It wasn't like IBM, but it was, uh, it was a chip from 2016. Yeah. But for Spectre, uh -huh. because remember we lost a bunch of processing power? Oh, so yes. If you don't care about Spectre, then like, oh yeah, use those older chips and it's uh -huh. way faster. But uh -huh. the weak link was nice. So oh, yeah. Thank you. 